Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this public event organised by Sperry and the Sheffield Political Economy Research Institute. Uh, my name's Tony Payne. I'm one of the two directors of Sperry, uh, the other director being Professor uh, Colin Hay. Now, I'm quite excited by what we have in prospect here this evening, but if I'm honest with you, I'm also a bit nervous since we haven't done anything quite like this before and I don't know quite how it's going to work out. Our idea has been to vary somewhat the format of an eminent figure giving a lecture and answering some questions at the end and to try instead to set up a bit of a dialogue, uh, a conversation in fact, via which some important contemporary ideas about political economy can be articulated in a, in a perhaps slightly more relaxed or at least somewhat different fashion. So the notion in our minds is that you're not in a lecture theatre or a big auditorium, even though I know that you know that you are, but rather that you're in someone's living room, uh, that it's late evening, not just after six o'clock on a wet night, uh, and that the liquid in the glasses on the table isn't water, which I fervently hope it is, <laughs> but rather a good and very clear malt whisky. So we'll see if it works, but please help by playing along with the game that that's the kind of event that we're putting on. And I want now to introduce our two conversationalists. You've come along tonight because we promised you Professor David Marquand in conversation. But as you'll see, we have two people on the platform, and our other guest is every bit as distinguished a political economist as David. So in one sense, we've been very unfair in not giving him full billing. But he's chair of Sperry's International Advisory Board, and so we can, I hope, get away with using and possibly abusing him in this way. Anyway, I'll come back to Andrew, uh, Andrew Gamble, for that is who it is in just a moment. But first, let me tell you a little bit about David Marquand. David was born in Wales in the mid-1930s into a political come academic come journalistic family. His father was a minister in the post-war Attlee government. Uh, David went to Oxford and then in his own phrase, at the absurdly young age of 25, became a leader writer on the then Manchester Guardian. He later became MP for Ashfield in Nottinghamshire for the years 1966 to 1977 when he resigned to become chief advisor to his political mentor Roy Jenkins when the latter was appointed president of the European Commission. Uh, David uh, later entered academic life in the 1980s and worked successively as a lecturer in politics at the University of Sussex and then as Professor of Politics at the University of Salford and then at this university before working for the final years of his career as Principal of Mansfield College, Oxford. But as I'm sure you'll see tonight, David has never really left politics. He was a founder member of the Social Democratic Party, the, the SDP, going on, I believe, but to deny this if you want, David, to rejoin the Labour Party after Tony Blair became leader, although then in turn going on to become a trenchant public critic uh, of New Labour. He also wrote an article in The Guardian in 2008, which was seen by some as being perhaps surprisingly complimentary about the then new leader of the Conservative Party, David Cameron. It'll be interesting to see whether that comes up and what David now feels about that piece. But most importantly of all in the university context, once David started writing books, he's never stopped. He has nine major books to his name and has edited another eight books. And I want now just quickly to read you the titles of his single authored books, because they'll give you not only the flavour of his mind, of the issues he's interested in, but they also attest to his extraordinary commitment to scholarship and debate over a long career. Starting in 1977, they are as follows. Ramsay MacDonald, a biography. Parliament for Europe. British politics and European elections. The Unprincipled Society. The Progressive Dilemma, a phrase which has come to be associated with David. The New Reckoning, Capitalism, States and Citizens. 
decline of the public, the hollowing out of citizenship. Britain since 1918, the strange career of British democracy. And most recently, just last year, the end of the West, the once and future Europe. It's quite a list. David, we're absolutely delighted to, to have you here. But sitting with David and about to engage him in conversation is Professor Andrew Gamble of the University of Cambridge. Now, as I said earlier, because I know him pretty well, and you can do this with close friends, I'm not going to give Andrew the same lengthy build-up I gave to David, but I am going to list some of Andrew's most distinguished publications after the la over the last 30 years so that you can see again his wide range of interests and his similar extraordinary intellectual productivity. Andrew has written The Conservative Nation, Britain in Decline, The Free Economy and the Strong State, Hayek, The Iron Cage of Liberty, Politics and Fate, Between Europe and America, The Future of British Politics, and then published in, in 2009 and a brilliantly concise account of the crisis that we are all living through, The Spectre at the Feast. So Andrew is another legend in political economy. And with two legends on two sofas, I'm hoping that the intellectual sparks will, will fly. I've just one last thing to say at the end of this uh, quite long introduction, for which I apologize, but that is to add that for both David and Andrew, this is also uh, a homecoming. They may now work uh, at the universities of Oxford and Cambridge, respectively. But they were both, and for a period at the same time, uh, professors in the Department of Politics at this university. Both were also, in their time, directors of what we used to call here the Political Economy Research Centre, uh, which was the forerunner of Sperry. So I'm delighted on behalf of Sperry and the university to welcome them here. And with some nervousness, I invite you, Andrew, now to yes. begin the conversation. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Tony, and uh, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here. I think uh, I am a bit nervous now after that introduction because uh, <laughs> um, we have got to make the intellectual sparks fly. But uh, well, let's start. Let's let's see where we where we get to. I, there's there's uh, uh, lots of different things we could talk about, David. Um, but uh, let's start with um, something that's happening uh, as we speak at the moment, that David Cameron is in Brussels. He's trying to um, negotiate a, uh, a budget settlement which will freeze the budget in, uh, in real terms. This is occurring against a background of uh, a lot of talk about is Britain heading for the exit in Europe? Um, against all the problems that exist currently in the, in the Eurozone, uh, an increasingly assertive Eurosceptic wing of the Conservative Party and the Labour Party uh, sounding much more Eurosceptic than it has done for a considerable time. Um, you have been a, um, a passionate supporter of Europe from the very beginning. What are your thoughts about where we've reached? Well, I think, um, oh, can I put in a plug first? M my, my book that uh, Tony mentioned has actually just come out in paperback. <laughs> and it's on sale for a very reasonable price. Um, anyway, that, that's enough of that. <laughs> yeah, well, perhaps I, since I mentioned the book, maybe I should uh, say this. Um, I, it was actually published uh, last May, of May last year. It was, of course, written before. It was fairly pessimistic. Um, then I had to do a new preface for the paperback edition, which was somewhat more pessimistic. That was written sort of after some of these horrors had happened. When I looked at it just the other day, I thought, my god, this is wild, rampant <laughs> optimism. Uh, the thing is getting worse and worse and worse. Um, I want really to say three things in, in response to you, Andrew. They're slightly tangential. First thing is, I think the um, crisis is very deep, of course. I think the 
possibility exists that one or two weak sisters might actually leave the euro. I don't think it would be a good thing if they did, but I think Greece might and possibly Portugal. But I also believe very, very strongly that both France and Germany have put such an enormous amount of political capital, emotional capital, moral capitalism, you might even say, into this project right since, well, virtually since 1950, um, that they're not going to let it go. That, I think, is we, we, we should accept that. Second point is, how is that going to work out? Well, of course, nobody knows. But I think the high probability is that the absurdity, which was at the heart of the euro uh, when it first was uh, brought in, not when it was first conceived, but when it was first brought in, the absurdity of thinking that you could have, if you like, a, a Europeanized monetary policy uh, and retain national fiscal policies, that was never going to work. Uh, and, of course, it hasn't worked. And what I think we're going to see is the conversion of the Eurozone into a kind of federal Europe. And the question is, who else is part of it? Um, I think myself that most of the countries... I mean, David Cameron keeps on talking as though there was a huge mass of countries outside the Eurozone desperately waiting for a British lead to smash the thing up. That's not the case. Most of the countries on the continent, which are not in the Eurozone, want to join it. And I think sooner or later will, if it survives. So I think the probability, not certainty, but probability is, is over time what we're going to see on the continent of Europe is the development of what amounts in practice to something very like a federal Europe. It won't be called that, but that's what it'll be. And that then poses the third question, which you, which you started off with, uh, Andrew, about, about Britain and Britain and the exit. Well, I think, I think those who say that Britain is heading for an exit, uh, I, I deplore this. I think it will be a disaster for this country and actually a disaster for Europe, too, because we have a lot to contribute. I think the odds are quite high that it will. But, but... I also think that that question intersects with the tense and difficult question of what happens to the United Kingdom. We talk about Britain as though it was a single country. It's not a single country. It's never been a single country. It's always been a multinational country. Uh, and I think if the United Kingdom did leave the European Union, Scotland would then leave the United Kingdom. Not straight away, but sooner or later. And if Scotland left the United Kingdom, as Tony said, I was born in Wales, and I probably still, I don't know, have a Welsh accent, I know, and I can't speak Welsh to my regret, but still, I feel more Welsh than anything else. I think the Welsh are never going to be happy to be left behind by the Scots. It's part of the history of this whole devolution thing. The Scots, the Scots demand it, and the Welsh think, well, what about us then? <laughs> Scots have certain powers. The Welsh say, well, perhaps we can have these powers too. And mm. gradually, they do. And I think if Scotland left the United Kingdom, which I think is quite likely to happen if Britain <coughs> leaves the Uni European Union, I think Wales would leave too. So what would be left? Mm. What would so be left would be England and Northern Ireland. Yeah. A very strange place <laughs> indeed. And I, I think that that needs to be brought into the discussion because they're treated as two completely separate things and they're not separate things. Yes. I mean, there is this sense, isn't there, that the uh, United Kingdom is unravelling at, at both ends, both the, the European project, which, I mean, uh, next year it will be the 40th anniversary of our entry mm -hmm. into the uh, European Union. Uh, obviously, the union with Scotland has lasted a lot longer than that. Um, but the, the sense that both these unions, which have defined British politics in, in the last... Uh, for, uh, uh, for, for, for a long time, um, that both of them could be unravelling in the next few years. And we could, we could see a, a, a quite different uh, um, 
configuration uh, in, 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 in the next few years? Yes, I think that's quite yeah. possible. And of course there's another dimension to it too. Part of the myth of the British political class is that we're a special country. Um, I thought we won the war and they didn't and so on. But not just that. Also we have this very important relationship with the most powerful country in the world. We speak the same language and they after all were a British colony once upon a time and so on and so on and so on. Well, I think the <laughs> it's actually a very strange paradox in American politics uh, going on at the moment. Um, the Obama people aren't like that. Some of them are, but a lot of them are not. How many Hispanics in America feel some special relationship with Britain? The so-called Latinos. How many blacks? The, the vast majority of American blacks voted for Obama. Funnily enough, it's the so-called red states, the hardcore, horrible Republicans, who are the most sort of British in, in, their, in their background. Now, I... I you wrote that wonderful book, Andrew, the, the uh, Britain and, what was it called, Europe and America. Mm. Anyway, that was the theme of it. You know, Britain torn between these two poles. The European pole may be um, sort of we're saying goodbye to. Mm. And meanwhile, the American pole is collapsing. Mm. So far as we're concerned. I mean, do you think that, because it's one of the puzzles about the current state of British politics is that there seems to be such confusion once again about where Britain, uh, what, what Britain's identity is, where Britain should be heading. Um, and there's no clarity from the political parties at all. It's, it's still, a, it's a very negative debate about, um, about Britain's relationship with Europe and it's also, even the relationship with Scotland is, is discussed in uh, very narrow economic, pragmatic mm, terms. Sure. I think it, I don't know, maybe this is something odd about British politics. Maybe it hasn't always been the case, actually. Mm. If you go back to the great historic debates of the 19th century over, for example, Irish home rule, very profound questions were raised and debated about what sort of country this was, what sort of people we were, um, and um, Yet yeah, you're right. Now the Scots talk about it. The Scots right. do, yeah. They Scots talk do. about it. They feel, uh, and they're right, of course. This is a historic European country, which is nation state. It was an independent nation state until 1707, after all, and it made a voluntary agreement to join this union with with England. It wasn't ever conquered, um, and they do feel different. And I think part of the reason is a sense that um, somehow Britain, or the United Kingdom, is becoming tedious and boring and also very right-wing. I, I, I actually had talked to a rather strange uh, meeting for me. Um, out of the blue, I was invited to talk to the London branch of the Scottish National Party. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very odd occasion. They were very nice people. They were terribly learned, actually, and perhaps rather Scottish, because they talked about Hegel all the time. But, so, I couldn't quite see what that had got to do with it. But anyway, <laughs> they, they, one, a, a young guy there said to me, look, he hadn't said anything out while all this talk about Hegel was going on. Um, and then he said, look, for me, it's very simple. I think... British politics are sunk in a kind of swamp. It doesn't seem to make any difference whether it's Conservative or Labour. It wasn't as if, I mean, the Conservatives are worse than Labour, but it's not as though the Labour Party, the Labour government of the new Labour period was particularly wonderful either. I think we can do better in Scotland. Mm. We are a social democratic nation. We have a social democratic culture. And so, why not have a go? Mm. And I, I have to say, I found it very difficult indeed to answer yes, that. I was going to ask you, I mean, do you, do you do, uh, do, would you actually regret if Scotland left the United Kingdom? If Wales left too, then I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Because okay. we, 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 the Welsh have got a social democratic culture. In fact, they're slightly more left wing than social democratic. Mm. No, sorry, that's it. Mm. Okay. And, 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 and in relation to the European Union, do you think that. Um, I mean, you say that you would be very much against Britain leaving the European Union, but do you think it would make. Do you think it would matter if Britain left? I mean, given that we've become so detached over the years, would it really matter if we, if, if we were now outside? Mm -hmm. It's a very tough question, actually, if you think about it seriously, isn't it? I think that... Well, I, I change, you know. My moods go up and down, depending on what I've had for breakfast, I suppose, as much <laughs> as anything else. But, but I... Um, I suppose I feel, well, a bit of me feels, if we're going to be like this, sulky, grudging, uh, not really accepting that we're part of it, looking at it entirely in terms of cost-benefit, we put this in and we want, to, we want to get that out, basically trying to be free riders, which is what I think we are doing economically, uh, on, the, on, on the rest. If that's what we're going to be, well, we might as well leave. Mm. What, what's the point of, of mm. being in? On the other hand, I suppose another bit of me says, well, um, this is actually a European country. We do not inhabit uh, a sort of rock in the middle of the Atlantic like St. Helena or somewhere. We are actually part of this continent, whether we like it or not. It's a fact of geography. Um, and um, it, would, it would mean a big rupture, actually, in our tradition and our history, which I think would be much more painful uh, than it would appear to be at mm. first sight. Mm. After all, we didn't go in at the beginning. Mm. We didn't go in at the beginning because of all sorts of reasons, some of which were not so stupid. Um, then Macmillan came to the conclusion that actually the Europe of the six was going to succeed, which a lot of people had thought it wouldn't, but by the, the late 50s, early 60s, it was clear it was going to succeed, and Macmillan then decided we'd better join. And it wasn't our fault that we didn't join, mm. it was de Gaulle's fault. So the first period from up until 1973, from the foundation of the whole thing in 1952, the Coal and Steel Community, uh, Partly it was our doing, and partly it was um, de Gaulle's doing. Um, so, I think we have a... Actually, what I think is, I think we have an ambivalent sort of love-hate relationship with the continent of Europe, actually. Mm. A very large number of uh, British people actually own houses in France. Um, I do. Tony Payne does. Uh, our former colleague Pat Side does. I mean, the place is littered with English people. And it's true that some of them live in a very strange Anglophone ghetto and, and never speak to the French, but not all, by any means. Um, so, and a lot more live in Spain as well. Um, Peter Lilly has a house there, too. Peter Lilly in Spain or in France? In France. Oh, right. Oh, well. Do I want to sell my bar? <laughs> no, I, I, so I, I think it is... I don't know. It, there's a sulk about it all. I think mm. that's it. And I think sulks are bad for you. Very bad, particularly if they've lasted for 40 years. Mm. Mm. There is a... I mean, I've, I've been uh, reading Hilary Mantel's books on Thomas Cromwell yeah, recently. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, actually, one of the very interesting things about that is the, 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 the very strong drive towards supremacy the English supremacy over the church yeah. and the way in which I mean the, the way in which that became hardwired into the culture and yeah. the rejection of the universalism of Europe which was represented at that time by the Catholic Church I mean that you still yeah. hear that in so many arguments yeah. today yeah. you hear it in, in the arguments about the um, um, about, about pr votes for prisoners and so mm. on and, yeah. and it, it, it's, it's this argument that the English Parliament should be sovereign and should decide and should not be bound by any external power. And that's exactly what um, Henry VIII and, and, and Thomas Cromwell fashioned. Yeah. In the... And there's an interesting sidelight on that. 
the Church of England is actually quite unique mm. because it's both Catholic and Protestant. Yes. And, and I've also been reading Hilary Mantel, yes. actually. Uh, God, that works a total genius, in yes. my opinion. Yes. Um, but anyway, um, Henry VIII, at least if Hilary Mantel is right, remained really a Catholic yes. in his theology. Yeah. Uh, and he just wanted, he didn't want to have the Pope telling him what to do. Um, and the eventual compromise was, I think, explicitly described as a via media, a middle way between Geneva and Rome. Uh, unique, actually. Mm. Unique in Europe. Um, Mansfield College, which, as Tony said, I was principal of for a time, was actually founded by Congregationalists. And one of the the statutes say that it has to have a chaplain from the Reformed tradition. The Reformed tradition does not include the Church of England. It's not really Reformed. It does include the Scottish Kirk. Yes. And it does include, of course, the Dutch Reformed Church. Yes. Now, maybe this has got, maybe this has got something to do with the Scottish attitude towards Europe. Yes. Calvinism is European. Yes. Yes. Uh, and of course, so is Catholicism, which is the other main religion yes. in, in, in Scotland. Yeah. Um, so maybe that is something to do with it. I never thought yeah. of that before. Yeah. Hmm. Well, let, let's go on to another big topic, um, which is the financial crisis and the politics of austerity. I mean, it's, it's, it's four years now since the financial crash, um, and it's become increasingly clear that this wasn't just a, um, a small event, yeah. but, but it, it, it's clearly an event which is defining a whole era now of, of economics. Um, I just wonder if you'd like, to, uh, so you've written a lot ab about this, David, um, whether you'd like just to reflect on how, what you think the main features of this, this period are now that are developing in political economy in the wake of this these events. The trouble with you, Andrew, is that you keep writing books which tell me what to think. <laughs> <laughs> and, and your book on the Spectre, which I, I thought was a brilliant book, uh, sort of lived with me ever since. And you said a very interesting thing in that book, that, that you can have crashes, and crashes happen periodically through the history of capitalism. And you, after, you know, they're nasty while they last, but people pick themselves up. But crises, I seem to remember you're saying, are different. Crises only happen <coughs> infrequently. And what crises do is to shuffle, to use a phrase of Tony Blair, to sort of shuffle the kaleidoscope in ways it can't be predicted. Um, and this, the, the thing that I find bizarre, actually, about the present crisis is that, because it is a crisis, not just a crash, is that um, whereas the Great Depression, the, 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 the crisis that started with the Wall Street crash in 29 and went on deep into the 30s, that crisis uh, led to very dramatic departures from the pre-crisis orthodoxy um, in Germany in a very unpleasant way, in the United States in a very, rather attractive way, Actually, even Britain, often thought of as a sticking doggedly to the old orthodoxy, even Britain didn't, as a matter mm. of fact. Britain went off the gold standard. Uh, Britain abandoned free trade, uh, set up the sterling area, uh, and had imperial preference. Big departures from the previous century and more uh, of British economic policy. This time, it hasn't really happened. Um, where is the voice that says, as Roosevelt did in his first inaugural, drive the money changers from the temple? Mm -hmm. Who's saying that? Mm -hmm. Nobody. Certainly not Nobody. Obama. Certainly not Obama. Mm -hmm. as certainly not, uh, actually, David Mil uh, Ed Miliband, not mm -hmm. really. He's doing a bit of it, but it's not very wholehearted. Mm -hmm. And I, I think what we're seeing is a very strange... There are arguments about if you like, fine-tuning, uh, the conservative gov the, the co coalition government's approach is basically that of the um, pre-Keynesian orthodoxy, trimmed up a bit, 
and the Labour opposition, not totally wholeheartedly, is basically adopting a Keynesian approach. But it seems to me that these differences are much less great than they seem. Because what strikes me about the two major parties, and, and actually the Lib Dems as well, is that they, 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 they wish to take different routes to the same destination. Mm. And that destination is, gov is business as usual, pre-crisis business as usual. And that seems to me to be mm. um, a, quite extraordinary, yeah. because the cr all right, this crisis has not been as catastrophic as the Great Depression was in, uh, 80 years ago, but it's not been very nice. Um, and B, it's extraordinary because it betrays a very strange lack uh, of political imagination, which particularly it seems to be worrying as, as somebody uh, who's on the left of British politics. Mm. Um, because I don't think the left can win, which I desperately wanted to do, I don't think can win on the ticket of really a sort of tarted up business as usual. Mm. Which is what I think it's basically saying now. It does seem very surprising, doesn't it, that, that, um, that, that I mean, the shock has been so severe and yet market fundamentalism is, has not been that damaged. No. Um, it, it's still, the, the arguments are, are still put as yeah, though yeah, yeah. the events of 2008 had not been. I reread, well actually it didn't reread, no that's, that's a lie. I read <laughs> for the first time uh, fairly recently um, Hayek's Road to Serfdom. I also read your book on Hayek, so to tell me what to think about the road to surfing, but that's by the way. Um, it's a marvellous book. It really is. Um, I mean, I disagree with it. I, I, uh, page after page, I was saying, no, no, no! <laughs> but you know, it's utterly brilliant. It really is. It absolutely crackles with intellectual excitement and a kind of savage contempt for his enemies. Yes. He, later on, he became a bit more pompous and sort of Germanic. <laughs> but that book is a great, great book. Um, it's a much more... Nothing like that has been written by anybody on the left. No. Well, for God knows how long. No. I think the last person, actually, who's written something of that sort of... that kind of emotional power was Tawny's Acquisitive Society, mm. and that was written in 1921. Yeah. So... Yeah. Um, the market fundamentalists yeah. have held the field. I don't know if you'd agree with this, uh, Andrew. Um, it's a slightly, if you like, idealistic view of how political change happens. I mean, putting the importance on ideas rather than on structures. But it does seem to me part of the problem is that nobody on the left has had the imagination, the genius, to counter market mm. fundamentalism in a really fundamental way. Yes, of course, there's a lot of kind of people complaining about it mm. and saying how horrible it is and how cruel it is and so on. But there's got to be more than that. Yeah. And clearly, I mean, I think uh, when, when you say everyone wants to return to business as usual, um, you're, you're putting your finger on something which is very important, namely that, that nobody can actually, in, in the conventional political universe, nobody can imagine a political economy which doesn't deliver growth. And yet, it's pre precisely this, the problem of growth, which, uh, and, and, and whether, uh, whether we can rely on growth in the future in the way that we've relied on it in the past, which uh, seems to me to be put in question by this crisis. And I think you've, yeah. well, I think you've, that, you've, you've, you've written about I, this I, too. I, I do think that. Um, I say it very hesitantly because, um, I mean, I suppose in one, I'm not an economist, you see, I mean, Andrew is a sort of economist. Um, part of me thinks, well, to say no growth is actually absurd because um, change equals growth in one sense. So an economy that's changing and you can't imagine a totally static economy is in one sense growing. But I th what I do think, though, very, very strongly is that the uh, green critique of um, 
if you like, the kind of economic growth that we've been having, or not all through my lifetime, but certainly all through my, well, really since the age of, since 1950, when I was about 18, um, all that time we've been having a particular model of growth, and that can't go on. Doesn't mean to say that uh, people's standard of living in some sense won't improve, but it won't be improving in, in the terms in which standard of living has been conceived mm. for this very long period. Um, that, that I feel in my guts, I can't, so to speak, mm. explain it intellectually, but I just have that feeling. And um, so, the connection between that green perception, that, that, that feeling, the gut feeling, and what's actually happening, that connection doesn't seem to be there. There's a complete mm. disconnect mm. between the political class and, and that uh, view of the world, and view of human beings, and view of nature. Um, and, um, you know, what the, what the conventional politics is doing, the business as usual people are doing, and say, well, you know, we, we can have a few wind farms, and uh, we can have electric cars, this and that, but, but I don't think that's getting to the heart of the matter. Now, how one, how one imagines a world where you have to change that mindset quite fundamentally, is, is, is mind-boggling, and I don't mm. know the answer to it. Mm. But I do feel, as I say, I kind of feel that it has to happen. Yes. I mean, I think it's the, uh, well, I mean, this, this recent book by Robert Skidelsky and Edward Skidelsky, mm. Um, mm. How Much Is Enough? Um, I mean, I think it, it, it's, uh, it's being discussed um, by, by people like, like them from a, um, a, 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 a progressive position. It's also being discussed a lot in the United States at the moment by people like Tyler Cohen, who's talking about um, we, we've used up all the low-hanging fruit. There's no, mm. more, um, there's no more technological innovations to be had. Um, and we've got to get used to a, uh, a very different kind of society which can't any longer afford welfare and can't afford large public programs. Um, and we've and it's got to get used to uh, permanently um, low growth. Um, and either of those positions, I mean, it's, it seems to me uh, if either is uh, even half right, then the sort of changes, sort of political changes they imply, are absolutely immense for the political parties. And it's understandable the political parties don't want to know about this because the, uh, uh, the implications in terms of, of winning votes and, and, and governing um, are just too horrendous. So everybody is hoping that after an interval things will resume as normal that, that recovery will happen, that um, steady growth will come back, and there will be a growth dividend to distribute in the form of rising living standards and uh, uh, increased public spending. Um, and that whole political economy model, though, is premised upon the possibility of coming out of this crisis with, with renewed growth. Of the sort we had before. Yeah. I do, I do insist on that, because I think, yeah. I think uh, the kind of, what we have conceived of as growth can't yeah. go on indefinitely. But that doesn't mean yeah. to say the economy has to be absolutely static. No. And, and it doesn't, by the way, either. I don't think the people who say there are no technological innovations to come, I think that's highly unlikely. No. Uh, I well, th I think there are some, but I mean, there, yeah. there, are, there are a lot of economic historians now who are saying, actually, um, the IT revolution, although it's produced a lot of technological innovations, they're not fundamental technological innovations in the way that uh, the internal combustion engine or electricity or running water were in the past, and that we haven't got the scope for productivity increases in the future that, um, um, that, that 
previous generations were able to rely on. And, I, and whether that's right or not, I think, is going to be one of the fundamental determinants of how, how this crisis plays out. But then that, of course, is making a slightly different point, isn't it? Mm. I, I, it's not therefore wrong. In fact, it's rather quite likely right that um, is not saying that we shouldn't try, it's saying we no. can't anyway, even well, if we did want to. Yeah, we can't. Right. We can't. Because yeah. of this point about productivity. So yeah. Mind you, though, if you look, I mean, there is another way of yeah. talking, isn't there, about this, which is um, of long waves, that you have a period of technological innovation um, which uh, does produce a huge um, shock, in a way, to the system. And it takes time to be absorbed. Um, and then it is absorbed. Mm. And then you proceed fairly steadily along the path that that wave of yes. technological innovation is produced. Um, and then that sort of peters out. And another yeah. wave of technological innovation yeah. start yeah. to happen. I mean, I, I, I find it hard to see how you can say that there cannot be new fundamental technologically. No. Well, I mean, who right. can say that? Who can say, nobody can say that. No. Nobody can say that. It's just that we haven't had one no. um, so far. Um, I think we t it's almost time to open up to the uh, to get uh, some questions and answers, but, but just let's just close on, on, on one thought, David. I mean, you're, you're, you're very well known for writing throughout your career about the progressive dilemma. Mm -hmm. um, so what is the progressive dilemma now, at, at this moment? What, what, where have we reached? What, what's the... I think the progressive dilemma, the progressive dilemma that I was talking about was really the dilemma of people who um, had been part of this broad-based progressive coalition before 1914, uh, after the Liberal Party uh, collapsed as a serious political force. What were they going to do? Um, Many of their values were not quite the same as those of the rising Labour Party. Um, on the other hand, they were also, most of them anyway, pretty firmly anti-conservative. That was their dilemma, How, and they resolved it in all sorts of different ways. Now, I think the dilemma may be um, poof, go deeper in a way. Um, I went recently to a... Um, a curious sort of weekend conference or half weekend conference run by an organization called Compass, which some of you may or may not have heard of. And it was very exciting and very exhilarating and I was thrilled to be there and there were lots of splendid people uh, doing all kinds of uh, things for, you know, the Green Party, the Friends of the Earth, uh, Occupy Movement, <coughs> UK Uncut, um, all of this bubbling around and what struck and then but what I found quite remarkable was how turned off these idealistic mostly young people certainly in comparison with me young people anyway um, how turned off they were from formal political formal politics and I think that's partly uh, happened to a certain degree all over the democratic world, I think, but it's particularly noticeable <clears throat> in this country. Um, the, uh, and partly it's the consequence, let's be blunt, about the, of the deep disappointment that so many people on the left felt uh, with the um, new Labour regime of Blair and Brown. And it hasn't recovered. That's part of the reason, but I don't think it's the only reason. So maybe the dilemma, the progressive dilemma of our day is how do pe people who, f who are progressives, how do they relate to the formal political process? Because f I love UK Uncut. I think these are great people. I love the uh, London Occupy. Uh, you know, I love the campaign for a living wage that's been going on in London. I mean, all of this is wonderful stuff. You can't not admire them. But um, I'm old-fashioned enough to think that in the end, if you actually want to change society, um, you can't only do it by this kind of uh, splendid, effervescent and exciting 
uh, extra political activity. You have to, you have to in the end, be prepared to, to some degree, compromise because politics is about compromise. You have to be prepared to compromise. You have to be able to work within the formal system. So maybe that's the dilemma now, the progressive dilemma now, that there's no political party that these people feel identified with, actually. Mm. The nearest one would be the Green Party. Mm. But then are you really all going to join the Green Party? There's only one Carolyn Lucas. Mm. Um, so and I don't know what the answer to that dilemma is, but that, mm. that may be where we're, okay. where we're at now. Okay. Well, let's open it up now to, to questions. I mean, uh, people are free to ask questions about uh, anything that we've been discussing or indeed any other, ask, any other issue which they want to uh, ask David. So, yes, please. Well, I'm, I'm at Hochfeld. I, sorry? Oh, right. I'm Anki Hochfeld and a long time ago oh, no. I, I, <laughs> I was a colleague of uh, both... Uh, the gentlemen that are sitting there. Now, um, it's been very enjoyable. I want to take you back to the question about Europe. I remember a long time ago, Andrew Gamble coming back from a trip to Japan, and that was during the, uh, <laughs> the first step of uh, European uh, Monetary Union uh, in 1992, when we had another sort of crisis of uh, mm. are we in and out. And I remember... Andrew saying, um, when we asked him, how was your trip to Japan, he, 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 Andrew said, the Japanese only have one question. There's only one thing they want to know. Are we in or out? Mm. And really that leads me to ask you, uh, one thing, I mean, it was very enjoyable hearing you talk about uh, sentiments and emotion, <laughs> whether uh, we will be in or out uh, of Europe. But... You didn't place it within a context of a global economy. I mean, how sustainable would it be or wouldn't it? And in Catalan at the moment, on Sunday, they're going to the vote. Business people are saying this is going to be terrible because we will lose our access to Europe. Equally here, voices are beginning to be heard now because in the business community, people are beginning to panic that who knows this time these silly conservative backbenchers might actually push it up. So why did you not place this within okay. the context of a globalised economy? Okay, thank and we'll take one or two questions oh, and okay. gather them I'll up. Right and then down these. Oh, I'll forget. So that, that's the globalised yeah. economy. Um, please, over, over there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh sorry, that's something there. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, that was very interesting. Um, just, um, in terms of, you, you talk a lot about progressive dilemma, and you, you addressed um, the decline of the Liberal Party um, sort of after the First World War. Um, I wonder what your views are. Are the Liberal, the liberal Democrats now, as they are, go, are going to go through a, mu a much wider decline um, now rather than just political difficulties? And, do you, and what do you feel mm. is the contribution of third party politics going to play in the next sort of 15 to 20 years. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And the third one, there was someone over here. There's someone the, back there. Uh, yeah. Then we'll, we'll have another round after that. Yeah, sure. please. When the young Scotsman asked you what's wrong with British politics, why didn't you reply there's nothing wrong? It's just um, the pragmatism that the British have, the, that the English have, rather, that they never resorted to political extremism. They're rational. They, they never do what? They never resorted to political extremism. And that is simply them just being uh, rationally patriotic and pragmatic about their policies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank so, wait, you. So, sorry, just to sum up, there's nothing wrong with British politics. It's just the general approach of the British public. Right. Okay. Well, David. Yeah, David okay. David. Well, um, I, I'm going to come to Anki's, Anki's question uh, last, actually. Um, it's the most difficult question, really. Um, the question about the, the Liberal Democrats, well, I think there has always been, at least since the late 19th century, uh, two sort of two wings in the Liberal Party and then the Liberal Democrat Party. There have been what you could call the social liberals and there have been economic liberals. They've not been totally separate, they've overlapped. But in very crude terms, that's been 
That's, there's, it's been a coalition of these two, these two groups. And the social liberals have been in the ascendant, certainly, um, for most of the time since, uh, since the Second World War, with a few sort of, you know, exceptions now and again. Um, what's happened in the present uh, period is that the um, economic liberals uh, have, as it were, taken over um, the so-called Orange Book liberals. If you read the book written by David Laws, who is the most uh, potent and powerful and vociferous and impressive of the, of the so what I'm calling economic liberals, it's perfectly clear that David Laws just hated the Labour Party. They didn't want to be part of a coalition with the Labour Party. This was a complete, this was just, they wanted, he wanted to be in coalition with the Conservatives um, on a broadly economic liberal um, project. The social liberals don't know what's happened, don't know what's hit them really. It's been quite horrible for them. They've um, hummed and hawed, they've tried to do this and that. Vince, Vince Cable is clearly really a social liberal, although he also contributed to the Orange Book. Um, and they, in a way, they've lost the plot, it seems to me. Now, the future of the Liberal Democrat Party, I think, is going to depend on how that struggle um, plays out. And I, I don't know, is the, only, is the only honest answer to that question. I don't see how you can know, really, what, how it's going to play out. Um, but I imagine that the Liberal Democrats will do badly in the next election. They won't do as badly as people think, I suspect, but they probably will do badly. And it partly depends on who survives. So, but, but the battle is open, I think, now. Um, and in that respect, we've seen a, a rather remarkable, uh, so to speak, you might almost call it a counter-revolution in the liberal in, in the liberal slash liberal democrats because they've been on the social on the social liberal um, thing for a very long time. That was certainly David Steele, uh, and uh, broadly speaking, not totally. It was Joe Grimmond, um, and it was most of the leading people in the Liberal Party, and then the Liberal Democrats. That's why it was so easy for the Social Democrats and the Liberal Democrats uh, and the Liberals to merge uh, in in the way that they did. Um, so that, I think, is, is, you know, is an open question. It's a very interesting question, but I don't know the answer to it, I'm afraid. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. On the question about England and England's uh, extremism and pragmatism and being that big the difference between the English and the Scots, I think that's what you were really getting at. Um, well, hmm, yes and no. Um, I think most Scottish people would rather resent being uh, told that they're extremists and not pragmatic. Um, I'm not sure that that's true. I think the difference is that um, England is actually a very strange place. Very, very strange. Um, I, don't th I don't know what the position is in Sheffield now, but when I was living in Sheffield and before that uh, on the edge of Greater Manchester, it occurred to me that the <laughs> the political culture of the north of England was rather social democratic too. It's actually the south of England <laughs> with a problem, um, and uh, where I now live. Um, and the the uh, so I, I I don't think there's this huge difference in in political style and and culture and so on between the English and the Scots. What what I think is true about them, um, I think the Scots are much. I mean. Uh, it's one of the reasons I like Scotland and Scotch people so much. It, they're very argumentative, and they and they and they they go at it. You know, they they're not. They don't. There's no sort of messing with the Scots. They get it. It's a real fight, um, and the English are getting embarrassed a little bit about arguments. And the Scots they like arguing about politics. They like arguing about. Religion, they like argue about you know, political philosophy. The, the English regard it as being a little bit sort of not quite genteel. But a bit sort of, uh, so that might be a difference of style. Anki's question about the global thing. Well, that is, you're quite right. Why didn't I say it? 
I don't know, because I didn't think of it. But anyway, um, I'm sorry I didn't, and I'm very glad that you've, you've raised it, because it is obviously a crucial question. I think there is, amongst the conservative Eurosceptics, at least the most vociferous of them, a sort of vision, uh, it's not always articulated very clearly or well, but is a, there is a vision of how, of how a, non, uh, a Britain outside Europe could fit into the, the global economy which is developing. Um, there was a brilliant article the other day in the Financial Times by Peter Mandelson who said, and I think this is broadly right, their view is that Britain should be Hong Kong. Britain should be to Europe what Hong Kong is to China. A sort of freebooting, free market uh, enterprise, um, swashbuckling uh, and uh, very economically liberal, etc., etc., etc. And Peter said, I think it's quite, quite right. The only trouble with this is that Europe is not China and Britain is not Hong Kong. <laughs> uh, but I think. <laughs> I, I do apart think, from that. I, apart from that, it's a very good idea. But, but I think, I think that, that is how they see it. And actually, you know, this, this does go back to the points that Andrew and I were, were making um, a moment, some moments ago. That the, um, apart from Peter Mandelson, actually, um, no other major political figure seems to me to be making that point. There's not, nobody's putting forward a view of how Britain fares within the European Union in the global economy and where Europe fits in to the global economy either. Um, I suppose this is partly because the crisis is so deep at the moment in the Eurozone that it, it's very difficult for anybody to, to lift their heads above the parapet and think about what it might be like in 10 or 20 years' time. Okay. I don't know, does that answer your question? Not mm. properly, no. but at least it starts. Let, let, let's have another, another round. Um, please, uh, here. Um, a really enjoyable talk. Um, I just wanted to ask about um, economic values. I know you're, you're both talking about politics, but um, at the moment we charge VAT um, if we want to renovate the housing stock. And we don't charge VAT if we want to build new homes. And I know there's um, been some work done on, on redefining economic values in order to bring neoclassical economics into, into a more re realistic frame in relation mm. to values in nature. Yeah. And I, I suppose my question is, is, is how, how much is politics hampered by the fact that we've got an economic system that doesn't actually account for how the planet actually works? Mm -hmm. Yeah, someone a very profound question. Someone please. at the front here, please. Um, David, if um, the UK leaves uh, the European Union, and if, as you say, um, surviving as independent nation states within this emerging global economy that we've been touching on is simply untenable, should England, the UK, join Alaska and Hawaii and become part of the United States? <laughs> if we could have the Hawaiian uh, climate, perhaps. Uh, there's some, right, someone right up, up at the back. There. You've uh, spoken a little bit about disillusion with politics. You mentioned that the, uh, the London SNP are, and well, as a Scot myself, this is a sentiment I agree with to some extent. You mentioned that young Compass members are also quite annoyed with the way things are, and so this is a point I wanted to return to. Um, so basically, why are people so disillusioned with politics? Um, you did touch on this a bit, but I wonder if I could push you for some more information. Is this just a problem with new labour, for example, or is it something more? Is it a problem with the institutional nature of the British state or of British democracy? 
Wow, you do okay. ask some easy questions, don't you? Yeah, um, thank you guys. Yes. Um, well, I suppose the, I, the one about joining the US is uh, the, the, is the first one I'm going to say something about because it's a. Um, what makes you think they'd want us? <laughs> I don't know if you, if any of you have ever read or seen a wonderful play by Bernard Shaw. I think it was called The Apple Cart. Was it? It was published. Mm. Uh, a, there's a king. Suddenly, Britain gets an intelligent king. And this, is, this is astounding. Um, and um, because he's so intelligent and attractive, um, the United States uh, decide that they would like to become part of the British Empire again. <laughs> and, and, and the king points out, but why do they want to do that? They'll take us over. Uh, now, I don't think people would think if we became like Hawaii or Alaska that we were going to take them over. But I don't think there'd be an enormous mass of support for the idea um, in the United States, actually, to be honest. Um, quite apart from the fact the Atlantic is quite wide, you know. <laughs> it is quite wide. I love America. I haven't been there for a long time, but I love it when I go. Um, when I go to America, that th what made me realize that I was really a European was spending a year as a graduate student in California in 1958-9. I loved it, absolutely adored it. But I also realized that I was actually a European and not an American, you know? That's what made me realize. I wasn't just British, I was also a European. Well, it all comes down to, I suppose, senses of identity and things like that which are very hard to talk about in a rational way. Um, on the point about, um, uh, what does that say? I can't read this. Um, uh, the um, economic values. Oh yes, why disillusion with politics? That's right. Well, I'll come back to that. The economic values point, I think, is very, very profound and perhaps is at the root of our problems. If you go back to the founding fathers, and they were fathers, not mothers, uh, mostly, uh, or perhaps all entirely. If you go back to Adam Smith, to David Ricardo, to Karl Marx, who after all was an economist as well, um, and even up into the 20th century, even as late as John Maynard Keynes, for them, and, and, and Marshall, the great, famous, well, I forget his first name suddenly, um, Cambridge economist at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century, who was Keynes's sort of idol for a long time. These people were, in the first place, they, were, they had a, a view of history. Um, one, one or two of them, actually, the first people who held economic posts at Cambridge University also taught history. And they were also, if you like, public moralists. They thought economics was related to morality and moral values. Adam Smith certainly thought that. The first famous book he wrote, the one that made his reputation, is called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. Um, now that way of looking at economics as a, as a broad, if you like, human discipline uh, got overtaken in the second half of the 20th century, I think, really, by mathematicians. And mathematics drove out political economy. That's why we started the Political Economy Research Centre, which this outfit now is the, is the descendant of. Because in a way, we wanted to go back to that view of economics as part of a, of a sort of broad human um, inquiry, uh, which would include values, as well as just techniques and mathematics. Um, and that, I think, is part of the problem that we are now in. The book of um, Robert Skidelsky and his son Edward Skidelsky, which Andrew mentioned just now, uh, How Much is Enough? What, what they have done in that book is to look way back to philosophers and theologians in the, in the much more remote past, I mean, starting off with Aristotle and then Aquinas and the thinkers of the Middle Ages, for whom economic life was part of social life, which was also, which also had, by definition, a moral dimension. And that, I think, is the problem. 
a large part of the problem that we now face, um, that it's become a technique, very, very clever technique. I mean, entrancing. I can see that if you've got a crossword puzzle solving sort of mind, it must be wonderful to play these games. Um, but it's not got anything to do with what happens in the world. And as I say, morality has gone out of the window. It needs to be brought back in. And I don't know, maybe Sperry will finally <laughs> succeed in doing that. We go back to Aquinas. That should be your motto, uh, <laughs> Tony. Um, but um, anyway, the, the, the other thing about disillusionment with politics, I think, um, well, the first thing is, I think we should, we should recognize that in one sense, th there was never a golden age. Uh, people were saying horrible things about politicians in the 1930s, uh, in the 1900s, in the 1830s, in the 1730s. <laughs> and, you know, they've always thought politicians were disgraceful, selfish, greedy, liars. And on the whole, they were right. Um, Shakespeare has some very nasty things, actually, about or, or like a scurvy politician seem to think, see the things thou dost not, you know? Mm -hmm. So that, that's one point to make. Um, avoid golden ageism. However, I think there is something has happened to British politics, and not only to British politics, it's true in America as well. It's true, I think, in most continental European countries, though I don't know them well enough to be sure. Politics has become in a strange way, professionalized. Professionalized in rather a bad concept of what a profession is. And if you look at the careers of people in politics now, um, a kind of standard career, well, take Ed Miliband. Very nice guy, I'm all for him, and I hope he wins, and I hope he becomes prime minister. But what has he done in life, actually? He's, uh, you know, he got a good degree from a good university. He then went and worked for, for um, Gordon Brown. Almost hard, you know, the, his, still wet behind the ears. Then he got a seat in Parliament, and then he got promoted to the Cabinet. Uh, and he's never actually done anything else. And the professionalization of politics has meant that it becomes it, partly it's the pressure, the absurd pressure on members of parliament to be totally, totally dedicated to parliamentary politics and nothing else. That it's almost impossible now to combine um, a sort of reasonably successful political career with a reasonable successful career outside politics at the same time. When I got elected to Parliament, that, that, was, that was still not the case, at least not nearly so much. And um, the result of this, I think, is that uh, all professions, you know, suffer from a kind of deformation professionnelle, as you put it in French, professional deformation. And the professional deformation of politicians is to run around like crazy doing silly things and nothing else. And it's partly because they don't have a base outside. They don't have... Dennis Healy used to talk about the importance of having a hinterland. And uh, that's a pretty good phrase, I think. You need to have a hinterland, which he certainly did. Yeah. Um, music, photography, in his case. Uh, family life, and so on. Roy Jenkins, who I, as Tony Payne um, said, was in a way my mentor for a while. Roy Jenkins, Roy Jenkins had an absolutely enormous hinterland, more hinterland than foreground, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Claris, you know, clumps, uh, all that. But, 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 but it would be nice to have a few more people like that. But it's very difficult. I mean, a Roy Jenkins of today, or a Tony Crosland of today, who wrote a great book, The Future of Socialism, one of the great classic texts of social democracy in, in, in the English language, when he was a member of parliament. I don't think you could do that now. Mm. I really don't. Um, so that, I think, is part of the reason. And, and the result of that is that um, somehow politicians all seem cut out of the same cloth, you know? 
tailored to the same size, and they sound, they sound the same somehow. When you hear them on the Today program or something like that, they're arguing with each other, you feel it sometimes that they're not really real people at all. They're sort of marionettes. Mm. Which is very mm. sad. I don't like to say that. I mean, I think it's, very, I think it's a very serious problem. Mm. OK, I'm looking at... I mean, have we got time for another round? Or? So five to ten minutes, OK, let's... So quick. So, up at the back there, please. Um, the red. OK, first, uh, thank you very much for your enlightening conversation. Uh, I'm quite interested in your book, The End of the West, The Once and Future Europe. And I don't know whether you have you ever read a book written by Martin Jacques, uh, The Rise of the Middle Kingdom and the End of Western World. And I think he writes something uh, similar. And as you talk a lot about uh, crisis, but personally, pr uh, the economic crisis for myself, is that like I got a chance to study here as a currency rate fallen? <laughs> Very good. And every, 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 cri every crisis has a silver lining. Yeah. <laughs> and in the, I just had a glance of your book online. That uh, last chapter of your book is which boundaries, whose history? I think like a crisis and opportunities always together. And I just wonder. Because, I'm sorry, I, I didn't read your book, but could I hear your ideas here, your current ideas? Mm. Thanks. Okay. Do you want to bring him on? Yes. Please, at Is the somebody, front here. That guy there has been... Sorry, all oh, right, and then, the and then we'll, go, we'll go over there. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Um, you were very gloomy about the prospects for economic growth into the near future. Uh, I wonder if I could ask how you would see the future of welfare entitlements and the future shape of the welfare state within that context. Okay, mm -hmm. and then, yeah, over, over here. Right at the beginning, uh, you, you said it, you thought it would be a shame if Greece and Portugal left the Eurozone, but given the continued pain of austerity cuts mm -hmm. on the Greek people, mm -hmm. do you not think they'd be better off getting out of Europe Mm. Um, defaulting on their debt and reintroducing a devalued drachma. Hmm. Another lot of tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> They're putting you through it, David. Can't, can't, you, can't you ask some easy questions? <laughs> um, is that is that three? Yes. That's oh, right. Three. Okay. Oh yes, it is. Yes, I can see now. Um, well, um, I think the pain of the kind of devaluation that would happen would be pretty great, you know. This, I'm taking the last question first. Um, people talk as if devaluation is always, you know, quite easy. But it could be quite precipitate if you imagine going back to the drachma or whatever the... I'm afraid I can't remember what the um, Portuguese currency was. Um, and um, it wouldn't be pleasant either. Um, what I do think, of course, is that the problem, I, I, I disagree very deeply, and I say that actually in the book that the guy at the back was kind enough to mention, I, I think that the, what you might call the Germanic concept of um, the problem of the Eurozone and so on is, is deeply flawed. I mean, I don't want to sound anti-German, but uh, but perhaps I am going to be anti-German, just a little tiny bit. Or anti-Angela Merkel, who isn't, of course, Germany. Um, I get the feeling, you see, that what really deep down, when she talks about this famous Schwäbische Hausfrau, um, we Germans, we took tough decisions. We, 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 we had to go through some painful austerity. Around under Schroeder, actually. Uh, and we've come out the other side and we've been rewarded for our virtue. And why can't these wretched people in southern Europe be like us? Um, and the answer is they're not. <laughs> and, you know, the, I mean, pluralistic. Europe is extraordinarily diverse and very pluralistic, and it's simply not credible that the entire European continent are all going to be suddenly German. And 
by the way, it wouldn't be a terribly good thing for Germany if they were. Um, very few Germans seem to recognize, I mean, obviously people who know about economics do it. There's a very, very good German commentator in the FT, Walter Munchau, who's superb on this point. Germany has, of course, been the great beneficiary of the euro because it's enabled, it's, it, basically they've had an undervalued currency. And that's why they've done so well. If, if the euro broke up and, and Germany left the Deutschmark and went back to the Deutschmark, it would shoot up in value. And what would then happen to these great German surpluses? It wouldn't be good news for them at all. So um, I'm, not, I'm not really answering the question, am I? Basically, I think they'd have a, they'd, the answer to it is if they, if they left and devalued and defaulted, it would be just as tough as being in, despite the far too exaggerated form of austerity that's been imposed on them, basically by the technocracy of Brussels and the technocracy of, 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 of the European Union in, as a whole. Second point, now, um, the end of the West and all that. Um, well, I, I, no, I haven't read the book by Martin Jakes. Um, I'm a great admirer of Martin Jakes, actually. But I haven't read that book. Um, what I was trying to say in the end of the West was that there, we Europeans have thought of ourselves, and indeed the Americans have too, as being progressive, rational, modern, uh, and uh, productive, facing an East, which is none of these things. And that's been our mindset for a very, very long time. Not always, of course. If you go back to the 18th century, late 18th century, um, the Chinese were viewed Europe with contempt, viewed England with contempt anyway. Um, there was a famous mission from England, to Britain, to go and to see if they could have trade with China. And the Chinese said, well, we're not very interested. We, we, we have no need for anything that you make. Uh, go away, you silly little people. Um, and of course, if you go back to the earlier times, to the, say the beginning of the 18th century, then Ch Ch China and India were both richer than Europe. But of course, in modern times, that hasn't been the case. And Western imperialism changed the whole map of the world and the whole way Europeans have looked at the world. Um, and what I tr was trying to argue in that book, and what I believe very, very strongly is, we have to stop thinking in that way because it's profoundly out of date it's just it was never true really and it's certainly not true now and that means we have to conceive of global politics and global political economy in a different way now in a way i think that that uh, that lesson is now being learnt um, probably in most of the uh, foreign offices and treasuries and prime ministerial um, offices uh, of, of Western countries, but I don't think it has really yet quite sunk in to the broad mass of the population. That's what I. That's hence the title, "The End of the West." Really, um, the point about um, welfare. Huh. I think the only honest answer to your question is I just don't know uh, how this would pan out. Um, I think this is one of the really big questions that people broadly of a broadly green outlook have got to think through. And I'm afraid, I don't think the, um, if you like, the Green Party, uh, the Green Movement, is doing that nearly enough yet. Uh, how you can imagine being a, a welfare society, perhaps rather than a welfare state, a welfare society in a world of finite resources and, and a totally different kind of uh, economic growth. Um, I don't know the answer, but I do think it's a big, big question. So I'm ducking out. <laughs> and not quite as verbosely as usual either. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Well, I'm, I'm sorry we didn't have time for all the questions, but Tony will now uh, wrap up. Yes, I just want to, to uh, wrap up and, and thank uh, David and Andrew. I thought that was a extraordinary rich exchange from which we'll each take different things. I've got to go back to Aquinas. I've got to start speaking more French to my neighbours in France. <laughs> uh, and we'll all take lots of, of different uh, 
observations and thought-provoking and rather nagging ideas from that exchange. I want to thank Andrew, as you saw, was much more than just the interrogator. Uh, uh, old friends, nice to see them both back here in Sheffield. Uh, I let me know whether you think this in-conversation format works. I rather liked it, and I think we might try and make this an annual Sperry event. But for now, please join me in thanking Andrew and David very much. <laughs>